bad idea. Here we go. I'll turn on the record here. As uh, as uh, Kelly and I were just talking, <laughs> the midterm on this course is coming up real soon. It's actually, I'm going to ask Lynn Royer to upload it like now, and I want it to cover tuning forks, tympanometry, and today's talk on outer and middle ear pathology. That's itsky pitsky. The end of the semester marches in on July 28th. Yeah. It's done. So we have to motor. So no worries. I might even have two Zoom sessions in one week. I might even do that. So and I was going to ask you, for next week, because it's the 4th of July on Tuesday, yeah. are were you going to move it to Monday or Wednesday? Yes, good okay. question. Good question. Let me look in my day timer. See, I'm up here in Canada, and our, our thing is the 1st of July. Oh, That's Canada's okay. 150th. So oh, you, wow. yeah, 150th for, for, for the Canucks here. Why don't we hold this Zoom session next on, on the, how's the third work for you? The third, that's fine. Monday the third? Monday the third, okay, so let's just change my thing Monday the yeah, third. Yeah, I'll try and I'll, I'll jot that in my day timer here as well okay. so that I write it down and make sure we do it. But uh, same, yeah, that's, same that's, time, same bat channel. Same time, 9.30, I mean my time, 11.30 uh, central time. And I guess uh, 10.30 Mountain my Time. time. Yeah. <laughs> 10.30 my time. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Let's tell some lies about outer and middle ear pathology. Yeehaw! Actually, why don't I, I'm going to have to, uh, 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 hang on a second here. I'll pull up the old PowerPoint. Okay. And swoop on down to my OTC, uh, all, also known as over the counter, and uh, pull up the old uh, <laughs> outer and middle ear disorders. Here we go. PowerPoint coming up now. We have lots of slides in it. As you can see, there's a ton of them. And, you, and at the very top of the screen, you'll see an outer ear canal. And then we're swooping down to look at eardrums. And then we're going to look at some audiograms dealing with middle ear pathology. And we'll just kind of basically, lots of them are quick slides. They're just showing sequential things, like how they do a stapedectomy for otosclerosis and things like that. And then we summarize at the very end with some various types of middle ear pathology. Okay, the audiograms associated with it. All right, so why don't we just home to go here and look at that good old outer ear. And I'm looking at my notes too. And when you're take, looking at the outer ear canal, always remember what we covered in acoustics, namely that it's a quarter wave resonator. It is one inch long or two and a half centimeters. And it naturally, therefore, because it's open at one end like a cylinder, it is going to resonate with frequencies four times the length. So it's going to resonate with frequencies that are four inches long or 10 centimeters long. And when you work that out in the good old formula, wavelength equals frequency or speed of sound over frequency, or frequency equals speed of sound over wavelength, doesn't matter, you're going to end up with a, a frequency slightly higher than 3000 hertz. That is why noise-induced hearing loss, which is sensory neural, drops at 4000 hertz and recuperates again at 8. It's because of the shape of the outer ear canal and the resonance that peaks at around 3,000 hertz. Okay, we'll, we'll look at that next week because noise-induced hearing loss is a sensory neural loss, but we're just looking at this outer ear right now. The resonance is also very important for speech because the high-frequency consonants are in the high frequencies and the resonance of the outer ear canal coincides with the, with, the, with the consonants. So it's a natural lifter. It helps us hear high frequency consonants better. So when anybody looks at an outer ear and says, why does it have its shape? That's why. The helix 
antihelix, and the length of the ear canal all serve to resonate with high frequencies, thus enabling us naturally to hear speech better. Here's the resonance I was talking about. Slide number two. There's the peak. Look at the resonance here. Here's your frequencies going across. You get about 20 decibels for free. And the peak is at 2700 hertz. And the ear canal we said is made out of, out of uh, skin and bone and tissue. So it's not a, a cylinder like glass. So the resonance isn't purely at 3000 hertz. It's spread apart, but basically there it is. And if you flip this resonance upside down, you'll get noise induced hearing loss. Okay, anyway, let's move. Here's the outer ear canal again, looking at its shape. And here's the sounds of speech laid across the audiogram. And there's the resonance laid on top of the audiogram, just to further underline that point. Okay, the outer ear canal is meant to lift speech. That's why our ears are shaped the way they are. If we didn't speak, our ears wouldn't be shaped. We'd have dog or cat's ears. So the good Lord or evolution, wherever you want to put it, has made it that the ear is matched for speech. Cool, huh? Now, so when you're looking at your notes too, it's important to take a peek here at the notes. Outer ear disorders, microtia, Atresia, stenosis, make sure you have those definitions down. Microtia means a tiny little outer ear. If you see someone with a tiny little outer ear, one of his ears is really small, chances are he's deaf in that ear. And there's a reason why. The outer ear is, comes from tissue called ectoderm. You don't have to know, I'm just talking, okay? And the, and the inner ear, nerve tissue, also comes from ectoderm. So if the outer ear is small, chances are the cochlea is malformed as well. It's just, uh, just FYI. Anosia, it says below, means an entirely absent outer ear, quite rare. Atresia. Now, atresia. Let's see if I got a picture of atresia. Here's atresia. Okay? This person has no outer ear canal. You can see that. That happens in some pathologies. It's genetic. It also happens with a pathology called Treacher-Collins syndrome. T-R-E-A-C-H-E-R, Treacher-Collins syndrome. These children look a little different, okay? Here's a treat, here's a Treacher-Collins treat, syndrome. Here's a fella, he's wearing a bone ink, a, a hearing aid delivering sound by bone conduction. He has no outer ear, okay? And the hearing aid is above on a headband, Many times today, these, these people wear a bone-anchored hearing aid where the surgeon actually puts in um, a tiny little screw into the, into the skull. And then the hearing aid is attached to it by a magnet, and it's called a bone-anchored hearing aid, Baha, B-A-H-A. That's done today. This is an old-fashioned method of delivering it where the child is wearing a headband. So that's different than a cochlear implant. That's by correct. Car. Good yeah, question. Okay. Yep, that's true. It's different. A cochlear implant is meant for sensory neural loss. That's quite severe or profound. And that that's tries true. to replace hair cells. That's a different kettle of fish altogether. So this really is glad you brought loss. that up. This is for conductive loss. This is for Very conductive loss. loss. Correct. Yep. Here's, a, here's a bone anchored hearing aid. This child is actually wearing a bone anchored hearing aid. Okay, she also has Treacher Collins syndrome. The implant is directly stuck into the mastoid bone, the skin covers it, and then the, the box of the hearing aid has a magnet and it sticks against it. And it delivers the sound by bone conduction to the cochlea, which is intact. Okay, all right, cool. You might have noticed a few slides earlier, and I'll go back to these here. These slides here were just meant as review. The middle ear, you may have learned this in anatomy class. The middle ear increases the reason you've got a middle ear. We talked about the reason you have an outer ear, okay, for this resonance. The reason you've got a middle ear is because the cochlea is filled with fluid, and airborne sound is gonna bounce off fluid. If you had your head under a pool, and I'm standing at the outside of the pool, you're not gonna hear me talking, right? My voice is gonna bounce off the water. That's why you have a middle ear, 
Look at how big the uh, eardrum is compared to the foot plate of the stapes. So if you push your hand hard against your face, you haven't got much pressure. But if you push your hand hard against your fingertip, you've got a lot of pressure, okay? So the middle ear takes sound over a big area and converges it onto a point, and that increases the pressure of sound. And that allows airborne sound to activate a fluid-filled cochlea. And we said, and you've learned more likely in anatomy class, that the middle ear increases sound pressure in three ways. The size of the drum, number one, the leverage action of the ossicles, number two, and the buckling action of the eardrum itself is the third thing. All these work together to increase the sound pressure by about 44 to one. Have a look at this slide here. 44 to one, those three things. And when you look at pressure increase that we studied in acoustics, and can you see how acoustics is such a fundamental course for everything? When you look at how acoustic, how the air pressure is in, or the sound pressure is increased, somewhere between 10 and 100. If you increase the pressure by 10, you go up 20 dB. You increase the pressure by 100, we learned in acoustics, you go up by 40. So if you increase the pressure 44 to 1, you go up by somewhere in between, which is about 30 to 35 dB. And that is what the middle ear does. It increases sound pressure by about 30 to 35 dB. So when you think of the tuning fork test that we covered two weeks ago, and you take the tuning fork and you go, thong, and you put it on your mastoid bone and you hear it, and then you hold it by the ear and it gets way louder, that's a definite, that is a demonstration of exactly this. That's a demonstration of how the middle ear increases sound pressure. Ding a tuning fork, hold it against the mastoid, listen to it, hear how loud it is, and now hold it by your ear and it's way louder. That's the 35 dB given by the middle ear. The Rene tuning fork test. See how it all fits together? All right, Dr. Heinrich Rene from 1819 to 1868. Tuning fork heard louder via air conduction. Is louder than a tuning fork heard via bone conduction. That's the best demonstration of the middle ear's purpose. And this is true for normal hearing, it says on the slide, and for pure sensory neural hearing loss. How come? Because in normal hearing and in sensory neural loss, there's nothing wrong with the middle ear. The middle ear thus makes up 30 to 35 dB. Cool. So here's atresia again. All right, if you're looking at your notes here, there's all kinds of stuff here. In the middle of your page one, you'll look at myringotomy, Myringoplasty and monomeric tympanic membrane. My myringotomy. Whoa, I'm echoing like crazy. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I don't know why that's know happening, why that's but, at happening rate, but at any rate, that's kind of strange. Kind of strange. It's, not, it's not that. Um, you're not echoing that on my end. Okay, good stuff. It's just a, an auditory illusion then. Myringotomy is a hole or a puncture made in the eardrum, and it's done to get at fluid for otitis media. We're going to look at that. Myringoplasty, every time you see the word plasty, think surgery. Think plastic surgery. It's a surgical repair for a perforated eardrum. Now, we should know as clinicians, a tiny pinhole in the eardrum will heal by itself. Okay, but a, but a larger hole might require a tympanoplasty. Sometimes surgeons are even known to use cigarette paper and they lay it across the hole on the eardrum and this, it serves as a scrim for new skin to grow across the hole on the eardrum. You will see a term in the middle of your page one in your notes called monomeric tympanic membrane. That's an abnormally compliant eardrum. All the tissues are no longer there. How many tissues does the eardrum have? It's got three. The outer, a middle, and an inner layer. 
The middle layer is very tough and fibrous. It's almost, called, it's almost like a spider web. And that's what gives the, the eardrum its tenseness, its stiffness. Now that, that layer, if that doesn't heal right, the person has an abnormally compliant eardrum, a monomeric tympanic membrane. It means all the layers are no longer there. The opposite is a tympanosclerosis. That's a thickened eardrum due to scarring. It's got calcium plaques on it. Maybe the person had lots of bouts of otitis media. So when you're looking at audiometry and outer ear disorders, okay, they can be very, very painful due to pressure from headphones. Now I'm going to look at where we're heading here and just kind of look, have you look at a few slides, okay? We're going to look at, at some eardrum. First of all, you're going to look at something called osteoma. And an osteoma, I always call it, hey, osteoma. These are bony, benign growths out in the ear canal. Have a look, see at this. Sometimes it's, it's, it, it's caused by people swimming in cold water. And it's in bo the body's natural defense against cold water. They're, they're, they're harmless, but they, they can be removed as well. A surgeon can remove them, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me, they are bony growths. So they, they, the, remember, the bony part of the ear canal is the inner half, the cartilaginous. When you think of your ear, think, think just the way you do your nose. You can bend the nose, okay? I'm going to make this uh, larger here. You can bend the nose like this at the end. The top is covered, the skin covers bone. And it's the same with the ear canal. The outer half you can wiggle. The inner half of skin covers bone. So now when we're looking at the ear again, you're looking at the osteomas. Those are growing in the inner half of the ear canal because they are bony growths, not the outer half. When you look in more at the outer half of the drum, here's where the wax is formed. So ear wax grows on the outer half where hair and sebaceous glands are. And that, that, that's the producer of wax. Now this person, if you see the screen here, this person will not have hearing loss because sound can still go past the wax. You can, still, you can see the hole there. So virtually no hearing loss will this person experience. But if, you use, if he uses a Q-tip, he's going to just jam that wax further in. Now see this wax is nice and what do you call it, soft, and it's very easy to remove. This wax has hardened. It gets, it gets darker. So darker earwax is associated with older earwax that's got more dirt in it. Okay, this person also can hear because you can see the drum behind the earwax. Earwax doesn't cause much hearing loss at all. Here might be, um, this person here has, has a hearing loss in his left ear, and it's due to external otitis. Now, always break down the words, oto, ear, itis, inflammation. So he's got an inflamed outer ear canal. But even think about wax. Wax, if the ear is completely plugged with wax, this is about the degree of hearing loss he's going to have. A slight, mild, maybe, degree of hearing loss. Wax, contrary to what people like to think, does not cause much hearing loss. It, it'll cause you a bit of conductive hearing loss. You'll have an air bone gap, a slight air bone gap, nothing to write home about. Make sure we all understand here on this audiogram, look at how the SRT, 30, how it agrees with pure tone averages. Very important. Notice how this SRT in the right ear basically agrees with pure tone averages. I just think that's important. And also, note the speech discrimination, 100% in both ears. Conductive hearing loss has no problem with speech discrimination. Now I'm showing you the most common outer, or I should say middle ear pathology. So outer ear pathology, external otitis, ear infection of the outer ear canal, osteoma we've covered, ear wax we've covered, cerumen. Huh. 
break down the word cerumen. Cerumen means earwax. And think of the word cerumen. I'll stop sharing for a second. Cerumen rhymes with, is, is close to the word sincerely. Sincere means without wax. If you loved someone in the Roman times, you gave the person a solid silver statue. It wasn't hollow and filled with wax. Sincerely. Sine sire. I'm serious. I'll say, I'm serial. <laughs> All right. Anyway, Otitis Media. Look, this is a typical audiogram of Otitis Media. Kids got an ear infection. Note the, the slight improvement at 2,000 hertz in air conduction. The reason why? Resonance of the middle ear ossicles. Okay? But the person has a, a mild to moderate flat hearing loss. Most conductive hearing losses are flat. It's important to understand that. They are flat, there's an air bone gap, and the speech discrimination is excellent. It might be at elevated, comfortable listening levels. It might be at elevated levels because conductive hearing loss is a plug in the ear. Always think about it like that. It's a plug in the ear. It's caused by osteoma, by earwax, by otitis media, and breakdown otitis media. Oto, ear, itis, inflammation, media, middle, middle ear infection. Now, otitis media, as we read down the page, oh yes, and something I need you to note too in the middle of your notes, what we read here, outer ear disorders can result in very mild conductive hearing loss, outer ear disorders have no associated, lots of them have no associated hearing loss because it's, osteomas don't completely block the canal, and then look what it says right below, watch out for collapsing ear canals. In elderly people, you are losing cartilage in your outer ears. And when you lose cartilage, if you cover the ear with a headphone, like a circumoral headphone, you might collapse the ear canal, which causes a high frequency, that's unusual, a high frequency air bone gap. So you might see a high frequency air bone gap with circumoral headphones in the elderly. The solution is use insert headphones because it forces the canal open. But just realize collapsed ear canals during hearing testing with circumoral headphones can result in a high frequency conductive air bone gap, highly unlikely due to natural causes. So if, they, if it collapses during the hearing test, will yeah. it reopen? Yeah. Will, it, will it correct itself eventually? Or no, not really. Not a, as, as long as you're wearing the headphone, it'll be collapsed. And then you oh, take off you the take headphone. The headphone off, it will open back up? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. And the solution for that person is to use insert headphones. Insert you bet. I was, I, I was never sure if it stayed collapsed. No. No, you know, no, 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 it doesn't. Tell you that the, no, <laughs> that would be a drag. No, yeah, I just you know. caused you a collapsed canal. Yeah, good one. <laughs> yeah, I would feel like a, a terrible, you know. That would be a bummer. Yes. <laughs> okay. When we look at otitis media, very common. Look at the stats there. 70% of American children before age two. Otitis media is because children have flat Faces. I wonder if I have a nice little picture of that puppy. Well, here's a picture of a myringotomy incision for otitis media. Okay, they're making a slice and they're putting a tube in the ear. Look at the shape of the tube. It's like a spool. And it's meant so that the spool stays in the hole. And it's due to otitis media. We'll look at this. By the way, have we got this down? Okay, five o'clock uh, cone of light from your otoscope is the right ear, seven o'clock cone of light for the left ear. Make sure we memorize that, you'll never know. Could be on a quiz, could be on a test, who knows? Here's a pressure equalizing tube. You can see it against a penny, okay? Good old A blink in there. And here's otitis media and children. Adults have a more vertical eustachian tube. Children have a more horizontal 
you station two. And that's because their skulls, look at the child's skull compared to an adult skull. Children have a flatter skull. So we adults have gravity working in our favor. Our eustachian tubes that drain from the middle ear better than children's do. Mothers who are nursing children should not be lying down while nursing children because the child is swallowing the milk and it's going to go right up into his ears. Dumb, dumb, dumb. Don't do that, okay? Children get otitis media quicker than adults because children have flatter faces. The eustachian tube is more horizontal. Let's follow the, 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 the course of otitis media. It has chapters like a book, the most common disorder of the middle ear, otitis media. Kid gets a throat infection, has a cold, okay? Tonsils are swollen. When the tonsils are swollen, the eustachian tubes won't open when he swallows. Eustachian tubes are like government offices, closed unless forced open, okay? Like banks. They don't like to be open, okay? They, they, they're always closed. They're closed that you have to force them open. They open when you swallow. And the purpose of the eustachian tube is to allow the middle ear to get new air because the middle ear space is constantly absorbing oxygen. The lining of the middle ear space always absorbs oxygen, okay? And if you don't get new air up there when you swallow, you're going to get a vacuum, all right? And so the first, this first stage of otitis media is sore throat, swollen tonsils. What happens? You station tubes no longer open when you swallow. Now you get a vacuum in the middle ear, stage two. That's early otitis media. What kind of tympanogram are you gonna see? You're gonna see a type C, a negative tympanogram. There you go, last week's topic covered today. Vacuum in the middle ear space. Next, what's gonna happen, chapter three, is the middle ear is going to produce fluid, clear, fluid like underneath a blister and that's called serous otitis media s-e-r-o-u-s serous otitis media now when you look through an otoscope you're going to see bubbles behind the eardrum and the eardrums will now begin to bulge mm -hmm. like this mm -hmm. they're filled with fluid and when you look at that eardrum, it's bulged now. Now you've got a type B tympanogram, a flat tympanogram. Stage four, now the fluid turns to pus. Now the non-infectious clear fluid turns white. Now it's pus. Now it's called purulent, P-U-R-U-L-E-N-T. Purulent. Some call it supperative. Huh, think of supper. <laughs> S-U-P-P-U-R-A-T-I-V-E. Supperative. Either one. That's stage four. Pus-filled middle ear. Stage five. Mastoiditis. Now the infection has crawled up into the mastoid bone itself. If it gets up into the bone itself, it ain't going to heal. Now you've got real problems because the roof of your middle ear is the eighth of an inch from the brain. Stage six, meningitis. You're dead. Okay? So now you're, that's middle ears, infections have been known to kill people. So I wonder, my, my stepdad lost a son to meningitis. There you go. 40 something years ago. Could have. And I wonder if it was from an untreated ear infection. Maybe, maybe, oh. but it could have been through something else too. Yeah. A lot of teenagers, for some reason, 
teens in 12th grade, 11th grade in high school, for some reason, they are the highest, they get the highest incidence of meningitis. And I don't know why that is. They may have been through a middle ear infection, but they might have gotten it another way as well. Yeah. Meningitis, the meninges <clears throat> is the, is a bag covering your brain. The brain. They call it the dura mater. Okay, D-U-R-A-M-A-T-E-R. And it covers the brain, and there's fluid underneath that, um, that, 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 that layer. And so that covers the brain. And when that fluid gets infected, that's, men, that's meningitis. It's, it, it'll, it usually leaves you dead. It's a, a terrible, terrible thing. Anyway, so the stages of otitis media, very important. Read that very carefully in your notes. The very, uh, the, the, you can do something about, men, about uh, otitis media. Here's a normal right ear. Look at the cone of light. You can see it's at five o'clock. Here is a normal eardrum again, cone of light, five o'clock. Here's retracted eardrum. Have a look at the retracted eardrum. You can even see where the eardrum is laying on the promontory. Look where my cursor is. Here's the neck piece bone. So this is, as the words as Joe Pesci would say on that movie Casino when he's got that head in a vice, that's gotta hurt, that's gotta hurt. Okay, look at how that's sucked back. I mean, that eardrum is retracted. Here's serous otitis media. Look at the bubbles. The fluid is clear. It's not infected yet, but look at this one. There's bulged otitis media, and the fluid is now white. Look at the umbo stuck right here. You can see the eardrum is just bulged. The, the, the umbo is not bulged as much, but the whole drum is just absolutely bulged. So that's advanced acute bulging otitis media. Here's another picture showing you a bulged eardrum. Look at this, separative otitis media. Okay, fluid filled, pus infected middle ear. Never ever fit hearing aids, of course, on something like this, you see a doctor. Okay, look at this, advanced separative otitis media. Again, it's good to have a look at eardrums to see what they actually look like. Okay, now here's a pressure equalizing tube stuck in a person's ear. When you see a tube in an ear, it's not a good idea to do tympanometry. Just best not do it. Because if the tube is functioning, you won't get a tympanogram, okay? Because you can't make a seal. You just can't because the tube is open. You're going to have a large physical volume. You'll have a flat tympanogram with a type B and a large physical volume because the air in the outer ear canal is communicating with the air behind the eardrum. Now, but also if the tube is plugged, you will get a tympanogram, but you stand in danger of pushing the tube because of excess air pressure right through the drum and into the person's middle ear space. Not a good idea. Now, here's a question. If the middle ear common normally makes up 30 to 35 dB, as we studied earlier today, then why can a conductive hearing loss be more than this? This is something we need to understand, and this is what separates Ozarks from IHS. Okay, this is what you are learning in a two-year college degree that the typical IHS grad isn't learning very well. Look at this carefully. If the middle ear, as we studied earlier today, makes, or as you learned in anatomy class, makes 30 to 35 dB, as it should because the cochlea is filled with fluid and airborne sound's going to bounce off of fluid, think about me standing outside the swimming pool and your head under the swimming pool. Okay, the sound's going to bounce off the water. Something has to help airborne sound activate a fluid-filled cochlea. Well, if that's the case, then why can a conductive hearing loss be greater than 30 to 35 dB? And the answer is this. Look at the picture. You're seeing sound waves coming in, and notice the sound waves are hitting the oval window and round window at the same time. If that's the case, 
There is no interaction. There is no oval window pushing in and round window bulging out. There is none of that interaction, interplay. And that will happen in this case with no eardrum and no ossicles. Okay, the sound waves are going to hit the round and oval window at the same time. But it will also happen with acute bulging otitis media because your ear is filled with pus. And you don't have that interplay, that interaction anymore between the oval and round windows. And that is why, W-H-Y, how come a conductive hearing loss can be greater than 30 to 35 dB that the middle ear naturally makes up? Very important for us to have a grasp on that. Now, when you have middle ear structures like an eardrum, and middle ear bones, notice that you, when your oval window pushes in, you're creating a traveling wave in the cochlea and your round window bulges out. You have that interplay with a healthy middle ear. Okay? Just a, a little detail that I think is overlooked all too often. Now, if we go to page two in our notes, Top of page two, you'll look at treatment for otitis media. And treatment of otitis media is, oh, yeah, this slide here is just showing you that interplay again. That's, that's what I'm saying. Or oval, indents, round window bulges, okay? But if that interplay is gone, okay, then you're going to have a problem. All right. So at any rate, this is just describing. Now I'm going to talk about treatment for otitis media. You have three treatments, basically. And I, I'll just let you read your notes, but basically I'll just tell you right here. The three treatments are antibiotics. That's the first one. But as you know, we're becoming immune to antibiotics. People have taken way too many antibiotics. And so your body, they might, you know what a lot of people do too? They'll take antibiotics and as soon as the infection is gone, they'll stop taking them. And now the disease rages back. And now it's pissed off. Now you've just woken up a sleeping giant. Antibiotics, we are becoming immune to them too. We've taken too much of them. The other, the other thing is pressure equalizing tubes. That's the way to get around using antibiotics. There's three groups of kids, by the way, BTW. One kid never gets otitis media. The next group gets it a few times. That was me. I had it about three or four times in my life. The third group of kid always gets them, and that's hereditary. Okay, you're just three groups of kids. Either you're this one, this one, or this one. You know, so it's can't help it. It's usually what's what, what's what you've inherited. Native Americans, First Nations, Aboriginal people, Indigenous peoples, are the most susceptible to otitis media. If you go to Northern Canada, where Eskimos live, middle ear infections are rampant. It's huge. It's just it, for some reason. I don't know why, but they get it. Bad. Anyway, three treatments. Antibiotics, tubes, pressure equalizing tubes. Now think of the logic behind tubes. Eustachian tubes aren't working. So no new middle, new air is getting into the middle ear space. So the, vis, the, the physician says, oh, screw it. If the back door doesn't work, and I, or if the front door isn't working, I'll use the back door. That's all it is. They just put a hole in the drum to allow air to communicate with the middle ear. That's why you have tubes. It replaces a misfunctioning eustachian tube. Okay? And they're only meant to be good for just a short period Correct. of time? Yep. Yeah, I never, I never knew that because I had a niece that had it put in. I thought they were good for a long time. No. Well, they, it depends on the on the type of tube. Some okay. of the tubes are meant to be for several months. Okay. Some of the tubes are meant to be for a half a year. Sometimes tubes are meant to last about a year. Okay, so it just depends on what the physician has decided to do. But the usual thing is that they are temporary. They fall out because remember the eardrum grows like a spiral. From the umbo out, the skin naturally migrates out. So it's natural for the, for the tube to grow out of the drum. And that's the idea. The oldest treatment is tonsillectomy. 
Now, you and I might remember this, okay? People who, 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 who are older than 30 years old will remember tonsillectomies. When I was a kid, every kid had, to, had the tonsils removed. That's in, in the 1960s, rip them out. Rip them out. Get your tonsils out. Then came the 70s. Hey, man, don't we remove the tonsils, man. They're natural, man. They're supposed to be there. That was the decade of tubes. Everybody used tubes. But guess, and antibiotics, antibiotics, antibiotics. Now we, doctors are, re, re, are going back to the old original. You know what, kid? We're taking out your tonsils because you're getting too many middle ear infections. Tonsillectomies and adenoidectomies. Taking the adenoids and tonsils out. My daughter had it done. No more middle ear infections. It's just the, it's, it's the common treatment. All right, so that's the top of page two. There you go. Look at that. We're cooking. We be jamming. All right. I'm going to share a screen again. Here is a typical audiogram illustrating a moderate conductive hearing loss in both ears. Notice the audiogram is relatively flat. Fairly typical of otitis media. Now, Martin has a funny way of drawing bone conduction. Look at the way he draws bone conduction. I don't know what he was smoking, but I mean, maybe your version of the book no longer does this, but my version is, I just think the bone conduction is drawn strange. Anyway, look at the SRTs, 55. They agree with pure tone averages. Look at the speech to scrim, fantastic, both ears. Look at the MCLs, look at the levels at which they recorded it, okay? The SRTs though are good. They added 30 dB on top of the SI, and so they must have been presenting at 85. Yep, it says 85 here. And the kid's got perfectly normal speech discrimination. It's a plug in the ear. What do you do with a plug in the ear? Talk louder, okay? And then God's in his heaven, all's well with the world, basically. So here's your types of tympanograms that, that follow the stages of otitis media, and we covered that last week. So no need to look at that again. Notice how conductive hearing loss is associated with absent acoustic reflexes, like we covered last week. Look at conductive loss. Here you've got cochlear hearing loss, conductive hearing loss, and retrocochlear hearing loss, tumors. This is the degree of hearing loss. If the, if the, even with a slight degree of conductive hearing loss, a high incidence of absent acoustic reflexes. If the conductive hearing loss gets to be 50 or 60, 100% chance the acoustic reflexes are gone, okay? Just re and then notice that with cochlear again, once the hearing loss gets to be a greater than 60, now you've got absent acoustic reflexes. But we'll cover that more next week, not today. Conductive hearing loss tends to obliterate acoustic reflexes. Look at this case study right here. This child has a slight hearing loss in one ear, the left ear, Look at the tympanograms, right ear normal, left ear flat, and look at the acoustic reflexes. Everything's absent except for the good ear, ipsilateral. And read what it says above here. A case of unilateral conductive hearing loss, contralateral acoustic reflexes with loud stimulus to the good ear. So here's right ear. I'm putting my hand here, delivering sound to my right ear. Will I get an acoustic reflex in the opposite ear? Uh-uh, because of the infection. Okay? Will I get an acoustic reflex if ipsilateral in my good ear? Yep. Contralateral? Uh-uh. Left ear. Try to get an acoustic reflex in this ear? Uh-uh. Can't make the sound loud enough. How come? Left ear is plugged with infection. Contralateral acoustic reflex, gone. Ipsilateral acoustic reflex, gone. So one hearing loss, well, conductive hearing loss in one ear results in only one acoustic reflex out of the possible four. Ipsilateral reflex in the good ear only. Okay? Next slide. Bilateral conductive hearing loss. Bilateral. Look at the temps, flat, acoustic reflexes, no response, no response, no response, no response. So hearing loss in both ears, sayonara, everything's abnormal. 
All right. This is just talking about another example out of Martin. Just showing you another slight hearing loss, mild conductive hearing loss produced by a retracted tympanic membrane. Okay, now this is a, this is a strange uh, uh, one to, to show. Notice the hearing loss is sloping. Highly unusual that that would be sloping. Usually the hearing loss is flat. Okay, but I think it's because the bone conduction thresholds are dropping here too. Look at the bone. It's dropping as well. So because the bone is dropping, the conductive component will be equal, the air bone gap will be equal across. And that, if the bone scores were flat, this hearing loss would be flat. Okay? Here's a cholesteatoma. Top of page two, cholesteatoma. Every time you see the word Oma, that's not Dutch or German for grandmother, okay? Oma means tumor. Every, any, time, any time you see a pathology ending with O-M-A, think tumor. Cholesteatoma is a tumor caused by a perforated eardrum. And the perforation is usually at the edge of the eardrum, the very edge. And the eardrum isn't healing properly. So when you've got that eardrum not healing properly, when they, and remember that the perforation is at the edge of the eardrum, then you're going to get skin entering the middle ear space. Read what it says there. Often begins with a perforated eardrum, causes rapidly growing benign tumor, which can then become fatal. So the tumor is growing inside the middle ear space, and it grows quickly. Cause... Perforated eardrum not healing properly, and the skin cells turn into a tumor, and they proliferate rapidly. The, the body's trying to heal itself, but it's doing it wrong. A cholesteatoma needs to be removed. Immediate surgery is treatment of choice. Do they okay. usually have pain? Does a person normally have pain in their ear, or just ah, hearing loss? Associated? Just hearing loss. Just hearing loss. But remember that roof of the middle ear is an eighth of an inch from the brain. They have to get it out. I have a, a good friend whose son had, had a cholesteatoma. He was brought into Kamloops Hospital in British Columbia and had that sucker removed. And they also removed his incus. They had to remove the middle ear bone. So he had an incusectomy. <laughs> <laughs> he had to get a prosthetic, a, a fake bone put in. Weird. That's funny. <laughs> Here's a that's so a, oh, my gosh. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Here's a picture of a cholesteatoma growing. Okay. Cross-sectional diagram, middle ear cavity, and here's the cholesteatoma. It's, it's going to extend to fill the middle ear space and the mastoid bone. Tissue destruction is common when it's in contact with bony structure, enhancing to the conductive hearing loss by reduced tympanic membrane movement, blah, blah, blah. Not good. Here's disarticulated ossicles. Look where the incus is no longer attached to the neck of the stapes. Oh. This can happen due to trauma, rolling, you know, you get in a car accident or something like that. Here's the tympanogram you're going to have with that at, at AD, an overly compliant eardrum because it's way too, too flaccid. Here's, here's a person with uh, uh, disarticulated ossicles. Read what it says here at the bottom. Audiogram and impedance results tympanogram results from unilateral ossicular discontinuity of the incudo incus stapedial joint. Just the picture that we saw here. Okay, this is the audiogram. Hearing loss of 60 dB. By the way, BTW, the maximum conductive hearing loss you can get with circumoral headphones is 60 dB. Okay? Insert headphones, the maximum is around 75 to 85 dB. So the maximum air bone gap you can get, the maximum measurable conductive hearing loss you can get depends on the headphone used to end the test. Promise that's going to be a question on a midterm. Got to be. All right. Here's the 60 dB loss. Must have been circumoral headphones. Ossicular discontinuity. Look at the tympanogram. It's off the board for the right ear. Left ear normal, 
and notice the shaded area showing you what's normal, and the right ear off the board. Okay, AD. Physical volume of the ear canal, we studied that last week. Again, a type B tympanogram, if you've got one, you've got to look at the physical volume. A large one might indicate a perforated eardrum as seen on the right. A tiny physical volume with a flat type B, then you better redo the tip because the probe tip is stuck against the outer wall. You bet you've got the probe tip inserted wrongly. Here's a view of, a, of again, a myringotomy, blah, 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 pressure equalizing tubes. Let's move on to otosclerosis. We've got to cover this puppy. Yeah, because we've only got, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes left in our seminar in our thing today. So another sip of coffee here, Ted. A little gargle there. All right. Otosclerosis. Otosclerosis. Look at the audiogram here. It's flat. Air, air conduction scores are flat. It's conductive. But look at the bone. Look at the notch. That notch in the bone conduction thresholds is called Carhartt's notch. That's the visual giveaway of otosclerosis. It's not an ear infection. Otosclerosis is hereditary. It is genetic. If mom or dad has it, chances are at least one of the kids is going to have it. Otosclerosis begins in young adulthood. And usually it's more common in Caucasians than in other races. It's hereditary, and what happens is the middle ear bones, I'll show you a picture of it. The middle ear bones, here you go. Here's a picture of otosclerosis. Soft, porous tissue surrounds the foot plate of the stapes. So now the middle ear is stiff. It's not moving, okay? You have a conductive hearing loss. And what type of tympanogram are you gonna have? A type AS. The peak is gonna be over normal air pressure, but it's gonna be smaller. The height of your pup tent will be small. The middle ear is made more stiff than it should. And here's what they do. They do a stapedectomy, as you can see here. The stapes is removed, and they put a titanium graft in place of the stapes. The surgery is not 100% successful. At times, it might fall out, and now the fluid leaks out of the cochlea, and the person is deaf. Okay? So it's not always successful. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. I know a woman with otosclerosis who has taken the opting out clause. Heck no, no surgery. I'll wear hearing aids. And so she wears hearing aids. Okay, but here's the steps of what they do. And Martin covers it quite well. Here's your tympanogram, type AS. Okay, it's stiff, but it's over zero. So it's, there's no, there's not, it's not a problem of air pressure. You're not going to find the peak over negative air pressure. That's otitis media. This is otosclerosis. So you can see that tympanometry also helps to diagnose or assess otosclerosis. And by the way, let's stop for a second here. The words diagnose. A lot of audiologists get their knickers in a knot when HISs want to do tympanometry. Oh, you're not supposed to diagnose. Well, neither is an audiologist. Okay? I was going to ask, the, an audiologist and an ENT. So like if you think someone has a tumor yep. because of, uh, uh, or a lesion, yep. You send them to an ENT, not an audiologist, correct? Uh, either one. You know either why? One? Because the audiologist will do brain waves. Oh, okay. okay. And they can, and then the audiologist can refer to an ENT. To an ENT. But ENT. either way, get the person out of your office, okay? Audiologists can't diagnose either. They don't have a, an MD, okay? They oh, have no. an AUD. The only one who can diagnose is a medical doctor. So you know what we do? I just say, results are consistent with. <laughs> results are consistent with otitis media results are consistent with otosclerosis done you're assessing you're not diagnosing you're saying hey my results look consistent with better check it out 
Okay, anyway, uh, food for thought, okay? Now, when you're looking here at, 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 at onosclerosis type AS, tympanogram, and look at what they do. They're gonna, the proper length of the prosthesis is measured, then they start hacking, they put a hole in the foot plate of the stapes, then they start cutting away the crura of the stapes and snipping away the, ten, the tendon for the uh, stapedius muscle. They take it away, they snap it off the neck of the incus, as you can see on the right here, and then they put in a prosthesis. Here's the neck of the incus bone, and they put in a prosthesis. Weird. There you go, they put fat in it to make it stay. So basically, diagram of conductive apparatus in the middle ear affected by otosclerosis. Here's your otosclerosis growing around the foot plate of the stapes. There it is again. And there's the surgery, therefore. They do it, there's various ways of doing it. But this is the question we need to answer for ourselves. Why does it present with Carhartt's notch? Why the drop in bone scores? Why do we have this thing here? Okay, this is Carhartt's notch. Is it because of the resonance? Partly, yes, partly. When you're thinking bone conduction, and I'm going to move the slides over to here. There's three contributions to bone conduction. One's called distortional. In other words, if I put the, the oscillator on the mastoid bone and vibrate the mastoid bone, you're going to hear, and, and you're causing a traveling wave in the cochlea. That's the kind of blah, okay? But you have a second and a third one, inertial. Your middle ear ossicles are, are not, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the slide away and just, uh, just talk here so that we can just see each other talk. If I'm vibrating the, with, the mastoid, with the oscillator on the mastoid, that's distortional. But the middle ear ossicles are also not attached to the skull. They're attached only by ligaments, right? So when my skull is vibrating, my ossicles are lagging a little bit behind. And that lagging causes inertial bone conduction. That helps to push the stapes in and out of the oval window. Thirdly, if I'm stimulating the mastoid bone, I'm creating a tiny air column in my ear canal. And that air column is moving back and forth ever so slightly. And that's dis that, that is the osseotympanic contribution. So distortional is the big one. And then you have its two little cousins, inertial and osseotympanic. Well, when you've got otosclerosis, that, that whole middle ear chain is fixated, right? Because of that growth of bone. So, so the inertial usual, part, okay. Lost the inertial part, and you've lost the osseotympanic part. You've lost two kissing cousins of contributions to bone conduction. So really, when we move the slide over here, when you're, when you're looking at this again, I'm going to share, share a screen again, and we'll move to it. Look at this. Distortional, inertial, and osseotympanic. And when you've got otosclerosis, you've knocked out two of those contributions. Inertial is gone, and osseotympanic is gone, because the middle ear ossicles are fused to the skull, and only the distortional contribution remains. And the bone conduction loss is noticed at the resonance of the middle ear ossicles. Hence the dip in British Columbia at 2000 hertz. All right, that's why. And here again is what separates Ozarks from IHS. Because you can bet your bottom dollar that the board certified HIS who took all that training does not know this and isn't walking around with this knowledge. It's what separates a two-year AA degree from, from the rest. I swear to God, this is a, these are the reasons why we need to become passionate about our training, because we learn why instead of just da-da-da-da-da-da-da. How come? Carhartt, the father of audiology, noticed this in 1950. It's one of the classics in audiologic literature. Bone conduction, the Carhartt's notch, is a mechanical artifact of the way we test bone conduction. It's the, it's a, the mixture of the, the particular pathology of otosclerosis 
combined with the way we test bone conduction. And that just produces Carhartt's notch, but it does not, repeat, not indicate hair cell damage at 2,000 hertz. It's an artifact. Oh, okay. okay. Not hair cell damage. Okay. Nope, it's not. Okay. Very, very, very important. So it's an artifact. So can you kind of explain what you mean by artifact? Or? Well, yes, it's just a, an art. It, it doesn't truly indicate, and I'll go up to the slide here and so we, we can look at it. See, here's, here it's shown again, Carhartt's notch. And just look at that picture. It doesn't indicate hair cell damage. Even though the bone conduction is down, it doesn't indicate a sensory neural loss. It's but just, an, it's, good. it's just, yep, everything's fine. It's just the, it's the mixture of the particular pathology provided by otosclerosis because the middle ear is now stiffened by the growth of bone around the foot plate of the stapes because of that the, and the way we test bone conduction, you're going to get Carhartt's notch. You've lost two of the, of the three contributions to bone conduction. Inertial is gone and osseotympanic is gone. All you're left with is distortional. And that's because of the particular pathology caused by otosclerosis. The, th the, the tissue of bone growing around the foot plate of the stapes. So now you've knocked out two of those three contributions. All you've got is the American bird now, okay? So now you've, you've so and that's going to be noticed mostly at the air at the resonance of the middle ear ossicles. Two thousand. I was going to say because this seems to follow the resonance, yep. the way the loss is in the bone conduction. So that would that would okay. I think it kind of makes sense now. Yeah. Okay, it's not the resonance of the outer ear. Don't think of yep. the resonance of the outer ear. It's got nothing to do with that. It's just yep. you're going to get a little bit of a loss at five hundred hertz because of that stiffening more loss at 1,000 hertz, but especially at 2,000 hertz, because that was the, is the normal resonance of the middle ear ossicles, okay? And then it gets better again at four. <coughs> and it's an artifact because it isn't true. It's not real. It doesn't really indicate sensory neural loss. It's just a mixture <coughs> of the particular pathology of, of otosclerosis combined with the way that we test bone conduction in audiometry. <clears throat> so it's just a, one of them things. All right. Look at this mixed hearing loss here. It's a mixed hearing loss. Notice how the con you've got a sensory neural loss in the right ear, and now the person in the left ear has an ear infection. But notice how the degree of loss is equal across the frequencies. If the, the right ear was normal, the left ear would be flat, would have, a, would have an air bone gap that was flat. But because the right ear has presbycusis perhaps, and the elderly person has an ear infection in his left ear, notice that the bone conduction thresholds are the same for both ears, okay? Left and right ear, they did masking here, and they found out that the left ear bone is just like the right ear bone, but there's an air bone gap and which is equal across the frequencies. Again, that's an earmark in quotes of conductive hearing loss. It's usually equal across the frequencies. This one happens to go down because the right ear hearing goes down as well. Capiche? Good. Da. All right. And now we're closing in on the, on the finish here. All right, basically, treatment for otosclerosis. You can read that for the heck of it, but I don't really care. Look at the battle, page three, stapes mobilization, fenestration. Stapedectomy is the most, is the real way to do it. Look at that middle one, though. <laughs> that was done in the 60s and 70s. That was, a, that was an interesting one. They stuck a needle through the guy's eardrum, and they wiggled the middle ear ossicles. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop sharing screen here. They <laughs> literally wiggled the middle of your ass, and then, hey, the hearing's perfectly normal again. And the guy thought, hey, I'm a freaking genius. Uh uh. A week later, <clears throat> seized up again. <laughs> so I realized, okay, it's like a car, a car that needs oil. You know, you, you can wiggle the ossicles, but you know what? <laughs> you're probably going to get noise-induced hearing loss because you're bashing the oval window in and out. Over, <laughs> anyway, don't do that. We yeah. are basic. I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to share screen here and see what we've got left. But we've basically covered 
middle ear disorders, basically. The, the big two are otitis media, which is way more common than otosclerosis, but otosclerosis, it was important to cover. Here, the, this is showing you unilateral hearing loss of two types, asymmetrical high frequency loss, okay? That's probably, here's noise-induced hearing loss. This one here is asymmetrical. That's a red flag. We'll cover that more next week and the week, the week after. This is a flat conductive hearing loss. Okay, it's more, it's a hearing loss is ten, tends to be flatter. Okay, let's see if I can. Here's, here's typical otitis media. What would you say the SRT? This, I'm giving these as kind of as exercises here. SRTs, what do you think they should be here? If we fill in the blanks. SRTs. Uh, 95, 100. SR, uh, speech reception thresholds? Mm -mm. They no? would be about 30 to 40. Or if I oh, should say 40 to 50, oh, they have to agree. Okay. Okay. Pure tone average. Okay, I'm thinking of speech um, recognition. So I got it. Okay, got it. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And speech discrimination, okay, what would his MCL be? Because you're going to do speech discriminant as MCL, right? So because he's got a plug in his ear, his MCL is going to be way up there, isn't it? Probably 75, maybe. Way up, yeah, at least. Yeah. yeah, at least. I would say around 85, way 85. up here. Okay. Speech discrimination, excellent, 90 to 100%. Yeah. Okay. okay, his UCLs will be off the board. They'll be 120 plus. He's got a plug in his ear. Tympanograms, not type A's. They'll be type B or C. Acoustic reflexes, absent. Okay. Bone conduction, though, wasn't done on both ears. So you don't really know here. This should have been done on both ears. But anyway, I call this one Horton Hears, like Horton Hears a who. <laughs> here's a, here, here's a, what, do you, what would you call this? Otosclerosis, because of Carhartt's notch. There you go. Mm -hmm. SRTs again, what would they be? Around 40 to 50. 40 to 50. Mm -hmm. MCLs, what are they going to be? Highly elevated again. Why? He's got a plug in his ear. So Speech okay. discrimination at MCL, fantastic. He's got a plug in his ear. All he needs is wonder working power. UCLs, off the board. He's got a plug in his ear. Tympanograms, what type of tints will he have? Um... And type B, type A, type C, type AS, type AD. Otosclerosis. Not going to be over negative air pressure because that's otitis media. So uh, is it going to be uh, an, a, the compliance isn't going to be right? Is that correct? Right? Correct. That's it's it's going to be a type AS, an abnormally AS. squat. Okay. Pentagram. Good. Okay. Well, look at the, look at this guy's name. Oh, not him again. <laughs> oh, not him again. <laughs> He's got a mixed hearing loss. Right ear SRT is going to be probably around 40 to 50. MCL, well, you know, we're going to look at this more next week. His hearing loss is sensory neural. MCL is going to be quite low. It's going to be around 70. In the left ear, it's going to be way higher because the left ear has a plug in his ear again. The left ear has that air bone gap, okay? And so there's going to have asymmetrical results. SRT for the left ear is going to be around 70 to 80, okay? Speech dis MCL is going to be different for the right ear, obviously. It's going to be way more for the left ear because the left ear has a plug in the, in the ear. It's got a conductor. It's going to have a very small dynamic range. Very right? small, yeah. yeah. But remember, his, because it's conductive, his UCL is going to be way higher too. Yeah. Right? So his, his floor is elevated, but his ceiling is also elevated. And that's kind of the way I, I always, and I'm going to say, well, our, our talk is basically done now. We're, we're through to, for today. But when I think of sensory neural, I, I do this. Here's UCL, maybe about 100. Thresholds are elevated. So his dynamic range is small. When you think con normal again, when you think conductive, make the whole elevator go up. The floor and ceiling go up together. The thresholds, this hand goes up. UCLs, this hand also goes up. Why? Because he's got a plug in his ear. Always think of conductive hearing loss as a plug. You're going out to mow the lawn. 
you're giving, you're putting your plugs in because you want to give yourself a conductive hearing loss on purpose. It means you can't hear very well, but it also means you can tolerate loud sounds. So your dynamic range hasn't changed at all. All you did was raise the whole box. The elevator just went up a floor. <laughs> Whereas with sensory neural, the elevator got the elevator got small. So now you got you got a duck. Now I'm standing on the chair in this room, but the ceiling hasn't gone up. And deafness is when the floor meets the ceiling. So now he can't hear until it hurts. As soon as he hears, it hurts. Oh, okay. You see what I'm saying? So if someone's using sign language and is deaf, don't shout in his ear because he's going to he's it's going to hurt, just like it would you and I. He just can't hear anything less than it hurt. He hears nothing until pain. Ouch. That's deafness. Anyway, we'd be done. We've gone yeah. over our time. We spent an hour and 10 minutes on this particular Zoom session. It has been a slice, as they say in Quebec. Adios, amigos. Okay, so, uh, when uh, Monday next week, right? Monday next week. Thank Monday. you for the reminder. I will make an announcement and send out a remind to the same effect. Okay? okay. okay. All right. Thanks for joining, and uh, we'll see you next time. We'll see you when we look at you. Okay. All right. You. Have All a right. good holiday. You too. All right.